Hey, I'm Stephanie and I am here in Naples, Spain. No, it's not Spain, it's Naples, Italy. <laughs> See, it's early in the morning and I'm not a morning person, but I'm so excited because here I have a brand new friend. I was just traveling and I met Helena and now Helena, I'm gonna mess up your last name. So will you please say your last name for me? Uh, Waldekiros. Waldekiros, yes, yes, yes. It's yes. easy. <laughs> okay, it's easy, yes, because you have it. And tell me, you're, now you are from Ethiopia, and, but you're a professor in the United States. I am, so I was born and raised in Ethiopia, mm -hmm. and uh, I uh, moved to the States when I uh, finished my undergraduate studies, and um, I am uh, an archaeologist, so my profession is zoo archaeology, so I study animal bones. Zoo archaeology, have you ever heard of that? I never heard of that. Since, until until one day ago, a zoo archaeologist. Yeah, so you study the bones of animals. From archaeological sites. From archaeological sites around the world. And now here you are in Naples doing it here. But you've, tell me what other countries have you studied bones of animals? Um, so I usually study animal bones from Africa. So I'm an Africanist and I'm really interested in um, you know the transition to food production in uh, Africa from hunting and gathering to... Okay agriculture but so. now good now tell me a little bit more we were mentioning before we went on camera about some some differences in customs between your culture in Ethiopia and the US and you were mentioning to me in graduate school that you were very stressed out so I don't know if we have any graduate students there watching or oh, people yeah. in the US so can you tell me how did you use food when you were in graduate school so it was one of the things I did, you know, to distress uh, not only for myself but with my friends. So I had friends, you know, I had friends from all over, um, you know, the world, from Asia, America, Europe. And so what I did was, whenever I got a chance, I would cook Ethiopian food. I would cook mm -hmm. a feast and Ooh. invite everyone to my home and. Uh, you know, let everyone, you know, distress and eat good food and nice. just forget about graduate school, you know, just for an hour or so. Just for an hour or so, okay. And you yeah. said, I heard you say that even when you were exhausted and you didn't want to cook, yeah. you still forced yourself to do it. Okay. I did it. I sometimes cook at midnight, you oh know, and I especially don't want to miss the good, you know, holidays, you know, the Ethiopian holidays like Easter, um, you know, Christmas. We have different dates yes. because it's a... Uh, an Eastern Orthodox Christian uh, culture, so we always, um, you know, fall behind uh, seven days and seven years uh, okay. from the European calendar. So, so we get to celebrate two Christmases and two um, Easter's. And, and it's like Spain, lots of holidays. Yes, but now tell me a little bit more about that because a lot of people we we teach at our school about how people in Ethiopia are some of the most strict. They they have. Um, they follow a vegan diet for almost the lo more days out of the year than anybody on the planet. Can you tell everybody a, bit, a little bit about that? Yes, so um, like I said, you know, Ethiopian um, Christianity is an Eastern Orthodox. So um, when we have holidays, for example, Lent, um, uh, before Easter, you yep. know, we fast 50 days. 50 days of yes. fasting. So it's yep. not just giving up one thing, it's fasting. So it's fasting means eating vegan. Correct, pure vegan, and it's prescribed for everyone. You don't get to choose, so you're not allowed to eat um, um, any dairy product. Right. No cheese, no milk, no eggs. Right. So it's not like it, it's not like in, in Christianity where you can say, "Oh, I will give up chocolate or I will give up pizza." You have to give up everything. So you yes. go vegan fifty days. That's Lent. Yes. And when else? Um, uh, when do you give up? When, other, when are other times that you fast? So there are uh, different fasting seasons. So there's a fasting season for um, dedicated to Mary, um, oh, the mother really? of Jesus. Yes. Okay. okay. Um, and uh, there are two uh, fasting seasons dedicated to her, one for before her birthday and one uh, just for her. And, and there are other um, uh, Ethiopian Orthodox specific uh, fastings uh, called the Zikgate Zom. Uh, Zom is fasting. So, so, um, so throughout the year, how many days would you say that the average Ethiopian person has to fast or eat vegan? They have to be vegan at least for six months. So you know, they're not. So there you go. We have corroborate. We have corroboration. Yes. We teach it. We say that. But here we have Helena who says six months 
people have to be bigger. Yes, six miles, and it's spread out throughout the year, but when you count it, it's six miles, you know, no meat, no, no chicken, nothing. It's not. Tons of vegetables, lentils, beans, peas, and you know all sorts of wonderful food. So it's it's really delicious. I love fasting season. You love fasting. Oh, that's good. And that's right. and you share with me that you you are a vegetarian. I am. I'm a vegetarian, and and so for me it's easy to transition to fasting because I only need to give up milk and butter. Right. And, and cheese. Just, yes. Right. Exactly. And chocolate. And chocolate. Yeah, but yes. you can eat dark chocolate. There's no milk in it? No! She needs to come to school. No, Jessica, see, we have somebody else who needs to come. Yes, yes we have. Like yes, I, I want you to come. Yes. You, yes, we have you have dark chocolate. We even, oh, look at these gorgeous cherries I got here in, in, uh, in Naples. So, uh, yeah, you can make, we, make, we make a, Jessica makes, oh, she's doing a black forest cake with, with you know, with cherries. Great. Yeah. And so, all vegan. Yes, of course, it's all vegan. Yeah, there's no, I'll, we'll talk about that later off camera. But yeah, so I'm curious, um, because you also have an interest, you told me, in salt. Yes. So um, tell me, you, I heard you say that you collect salt from around the world. I do, and people bring it to me, and whenever I go, even from Germany, from, you know, Halle, uh, Halle means salt, so it used to be, um, you know, during the Roman time, one of those um, salt trading centers for okay. Europe, so I have salt from Germany, uh, people brought salt for me from the Himalayas. Um, I have salt from Ethiopia, where I do most of my salt research. And I'm, I'm really interested in the whole aspect of things. I, I love looking at how, in the past, you know, salt trade really structured big empires in China, you know, Africa, Mesopotamia, because today, you know, we have salt everywhere. That's yeah. right. I know we don't it's have. There's not cheap. salt is not it doesn't has no respect. Yes. Because, like you said, it used, it used to be almost ha worth half of its weight in gold. Exactly. It was more expensive than gold in More the expensive, wow. Yes. That's incredible. Because there are only few naturally occurring salt sources in the past, so you have to be lucky enough to have it in your region or country, and whoever controls salt controlled everything. You know, the economy, politics. It was like the, the well, as we know now, they're, the oil-rich countries are so powerful. So it was kind of the oil of the day, wasn't it? Correct. The same. Right. And like you said, now it's on every table, and the people don't. It's it's it's, it's just fascinating how things change. Yeah, it's really it blows your mind, you know, how salt has become an everyday mundane, you know, product. It and is. It was really precious. But imagine we talk about at the school. Imagine eating a meal without salt. We talk about the yeah, yeah. Yeah, four legs of the flavor <laughs> chair. You know, we talk about sweet. Everyone loves sweet, right? And then there's salt because we also want fat and acid because that's how, that's what makes things good. But imagine food with, or things without salt. Exactly. And again, you know, as a food waste archaeologist, that's one thing. You know, I'm also interested in not only salt as a commodity or economic product, but also how salt made us. You know, eat so many plants we would never have dared to eat. So it made things. You know, edible for us. Can you give me an example of that? Give so me an example of a plant. Though. Most of the leafy plants we eat today, you know, were, you know, because we were able to put salt in it, you know, otherwise they would be so sour and, you know, disgusting to eat. And most of the plant, the grains, you know, um, we were able to eat because of, you know, use of salt, basically. It does do a lot. I couldn't imagine a kitchen without salt. Me too. <laughs> you know, there are people who want to eat, eat lower salt diets, which is great. But, uh, you know, there, and there are a lot of naturally occurring salts, but I couldn't imagine it without salt. Not good at all. And the interesting thing about salt is that we don't need much of it, right? We don't need it in our, we only need a little bit, you know, but for our palate, you know, you can basically taste food when there's salt in it. Otherwise, it tastes like nothing. Brings up the flavor, and you know more about this. But <laughs> <laughs> well, well, we'll have to get. I know you have to get to work because you have to go work on your bones. Uh, but tell me, I, I have one last question because because uh, can you tell me what is your special? I know you cook, but which one dish? You know, in, in Ethiopia, we, we tried to go to an Ethiopian restaurant here in Naples, and darn it, they don't have one. There's one in Rome, so if you're coming to Rome, you can go to an Ethiopian. Yeah. But uh, I. 
the large bread is called injera, and it's made with coarse teff flour, which is gluten free. But uh, you mentioned that that it's very lab labor intensive, and that you don't make it yourself you, uh, when you make when you make your large parties. But tell me, uh, of the dishes that go on top, which is your favorite to make and eat? Oh my God, that's a hard question. Oh, but it's just one. <laughs> if I have to choose one, yeah. I love shiro. Shiro. Yes. How do you spell that? Uh, S H R E O. S H R E O. Okay, and what's in that? So, um, the base is um, chickpeas and um, beans, fava beans. Oh, chickpeas and beans. So no, she doesn't know why. My nickname is the Bean Queen. Yes. Okay. I didn't know yes. that. Yes. So the so the preparation before you know it's cooked is that you have to um, roast the beans and peas, and then you have to mill them with seven types of spices. Okay. So thyme, oh. garlic, um, ginger. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and Do you use um, the berber is it berberry berber ber I can't say berberry berberry oh, yeah. I love that spice blend it's yummy oh yes so the, the spice blend for berberry mm -hmm. so coriander you know cumin cumin oh so good and um, and we have one special um, spice domesticated in Ethiopia called uh, Coralima 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 yes the wild one grows only in uh, Ethiopia. Uganda in East Africa, but domesticated in Ethiopia, and it's it's like you know a heaven's kind of uh, spice. I have to get that. That's the secret ingredient. Do you have to get that just in Ethiopia, or can you get that online? Um, you can try it online. Okay. I always get it from Ethiopia. Of course you do, because you go home. Yes. So Koralima is the secret okay. ingredient, and then of course you know once it's milled, you just it's like an instant soup. It's very milk, you know. Creamy. It's so creamy, right? Yeah. Wonderful. So that's my favorite. Oh, wonderful. Well, thank you so much for coming on camera. I appreciate it. See, I, I met Helena right here in Naples, and she's a, a visiting professor, and she's working on, she's doing her bone research, and we just just met, and we've, we've broken bread, and we talked. Uh, we have so much in common, and, and hopefully I can get you to come to Mallorca and take oh, yes. some classes. I'm going to do that next year for sure. Good. So we'll get her to come, and you can see, you can and it'll, it's fig season, and you can come and taste it. It'll be uh, the end of our citrus season. We have w wonderful, I love it. You can see yes, or yes, yes, yes. We have oranges and lemons, <laughs> and, lemons and, and it's wonderful. Oh, and I'll show you. It's a pleasure to meet you. Thank you so much. It's been nice meeting you too. Bye bye. And that's it.